Good to see you both again. So let's go ahead and um, just get started. What we'll do is I'd love to just throw out a couple questions and then have each of you sort of respond. And because this is such a lofty topic, especially related to MDBs and DFIs, um, I would describe this as taking bites of the apple. So, so with that, let's just start with the overarching kind of consideration. I'm looking at Yasmin, so starting with Yasmin. Um, consideration around what's the role of MDBs, DFIs as it relates to development finance, and with respect to BII, where are you within that ecosystem of, of uh, blended finance players? Yeah, thank you very much, Leah, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. I am walking into this conversation coming from a dinner last night where I was reminded about the diversity of backgrounds that are at this conference, including uh, someone at my table who was a startup founder for an e-bike manufacturer in Germany and someone who'd been a reality TV star in wrestling. So I'm, I'm here to appeal to the, the range of audience that could be sitting around this table. Um, so development finance is the practice of using um, a nation's wealth to support our community around the world for economic development. I'm a managing director at British International Investment, so we are the UK's arm of that practice. We are a part of the foreign development policy. And the way we think about our role is to support our, um, the countries where we invest, Africa and Asia, across Africa and Asia, the countries in their path to development of the private sector. So we are investing equity, debt, and funds we have about a $10 billion portfolio. We invest about one and a half to $2 billion a year across all different sectors in those regions. And one of the things that this distinguishes us as an institution from some of the multilateral development agencies, like the International Finance Corporation, the arm of the World Bank, is that we have a single shareholder. So we are just funded by the UK government. Other agencies are funded by many, many governments and have a multi-stakeholder uh, opportunity in respect of that as well. So one of the things I really love about our approach is that we are really aligned with our shareholder to be catalytic in the markets where we invest. And we have a lot of flexibility to take a risk appetite to the market to look at the whole spectrum of companies and partners from very early stage to more developed and accelerating for growth. Okay, would love to dig into that more. I think BII serves as an excellent model for DFIs more broadly. Um, before doing so, Celia, tell us a bit more what's happening. Oh, I'm sorry, Christina, thank you. So lots of names. See, see, we, we clearly know each other quite well. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. I appreciate that. Um, so, Christina, remind us again um, GSG's journey at the local level with respect to how it's built relationships with regulators, central banks, along with um, perhaps ministers of finance, and why that's important to blended finance. A lot in there to unpack. So, let me start with who we are and explain, therefore, the context of where we operate and how, how we come into this conversation. Okay. So, the GSG was started 10 years ago. Um, also at the G7, um, and so at that moment in time, the G7 countries, um, for something that was called the Social Impact Investment Task Force, created what we call national advisory boards, bringing together people who are practitioners of impact investment, um, people from the government, and other, uh, I would say, experts to really look at what impact investment is and means for their countries. Now, that model has really spread across the world, and we today represent 36 countries that have these national advisory boards. Basically, our role, and our mission is really simple, is to make sure that there's significantly more capital that is allocated into social and environmental impact around the world. And we do that mostly by helping countries create these new institutions that bring together all of the ecosystem players mm -hmm. to um, create strategies and then implement them so that more capital can flow towards social and environmental impact. And usually, how do they do that? They change policies, work with regulators, and they create new kinds of financial instruments or financial um, vehicles that will enable more capital to be allocated to impact. So we, we, we really have this very, um, I would say, comprehensive and very holistic view and approach in each and every country. 
And so we work with the 36 countries where these national advisory boards exist, but we also work with a range of other countries around the world to help them do exactly that. Now, how does, it, how does this relevant to, to, to the conversation? So <clears throat> we represent these countries all around the world. Um, so they are in every continent. And we see a very um, important need um, to drive more capital flows towards the SDGs in emerging markets. That's right. Yeah. So let me just take a, a, a few minutes to, to set the scene. At the moment, there is only 4%, 4%, 1, 2, 3, 4, f of capital flows in the world flowing to emerging markets. So it's really, really small. The second thing is that only 20% of assets under management are managed in emerging markets. Now, if you look at that, and if you look at the need of capital to finance the SDGs, it's 4.2 trillion a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge we have is that, that there's an enormous gap to finance the SDGs. So we need capital that is coming, I would say, from the global north, mm -hmm. where most of the assets are being managed and held. And we also need to unlock capital from the local markets where, uh, for example, there is um, money from pension funds, there is money from governments, there is also a lot of uh, private investments available. But none of that money, or a very little portion of that money today, is flowing towards impact. So the, the challenge we have is a very systemic challenge. How do we allow for capital to be invested in emerging markets for the SDGs? So that's where we come in, and that's where we help these national organizations, national institutions, to really look at what are the solutions yeah. and what are the kinds of vehicles and policies that will allow that to happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising that. And, and for those who aren't aware, there is this $4 trillion financing gap to reach the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Uh, blended finance, in particular convergence, was sort of started seven years ago at the Innovative Finance uh, Summit in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, which was specifically built and developed to address this financing gap, recognizing that more private capital needed to flow into these markets, and blended finance being one solution. So Christina is very wise to sort of point out that's one reason we're here on stage. So thank you. And I, in particular, am very fascinated by GSG's model because not necessarily enough is done at the local level to drive more local capital into that financing gap. And so, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to the Development Finance Institution, uh, Bia, on the stage. And talk, when, when I spoke with you, Yasmin, you had such an interesting story to tell about BAI's journey. And when we spoke originally, um, and this is for you to describe in more detail, but you're in a position where you're return seeking but risk taking at the same time and had the opportunity to create a bit of an exploratory space at BAI that was off the balance sheet, in which they, meaning BAI, could determine whether or not blended finance was working for, for BAI. So tell us a bit more about that journey and then how, how, you, how you've landed and, and what, what the future looks like. Yeah, thank you, Leah. Um, so the journey started about 10 years ago with a, with a hypothesis that if we took more risk, we might drive more or a different kind of impact. And uh, I had the pleasure of being an advisor to that portfolio from outside of the institution for several years while they developed the work. It was, I think, a 40 million pound investment experiment. And so I watched this portfolio. It started in a fund of funds kind of concept, looking at impact investment funds. And the, the trajectory between kind of 2013 to 2017 was demonstrating some milestones of success along the way with uh, an emerging pipeline of opportunities that were looking in the nature that we wanted to see with the impact intentionality to deliver outcomes in the markets where we invest. Um, we were developing better practices in terms of the governance and the decision making around how are you looking at taking higher risk mm -hmm. um, and what kind of higher, what do you mean by higher impact? Um, and so in 2017, there was a, a decision to actually take this experiment and really double down on it. 
Uh, and I joined the firm in 2018 to head up that portfolio. When I was hired, my, my job title said CIO of the higher risk portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, okay, that's the first thing we have to change. You don't go into the market saying, I'm looking for risk. Have you got risk? You go into the market saying, I'm looking for outcomes. I'm looking for some kind of impact story. So, so we need to define what's the impact story we're seeking and then define the risk appetite that we have to use to take a flexible approach to pursue that. And so what we've developed is what we call the enhanced development impact framework, because everything we invest in has an impact story. So this portfolio, which we've also rebranded as the Catalyst portfolio, pursues uh, a, a very high percentage of low-income people in terms of an inclusion angle or transformational sustainability impact. So we have a framework that says you have to meet these hurdles on the impact side. If you meet those hurdles, we are ready to take a flexible approach to the risk profile of the investment. and. I just want to make another comment here um, about language. Mm -hmm. So I, I use the word catalyst in naming the portfolio. Someone earlier talked about catalytic capital. The catalytic capital consortium is an organization that's come together across a couple of foundations to think about how to work with this type of flexibility. I really like that framing. It feels very different from the language of concessional capital. Yeah. To me, concessional capital is saying, I'm ready to take less. Is that a change <laughs> we want for now? I like, think right now? so. I agree. I think so. I'm on, okay. It's more about Notated. the catalyst, you know, the catalytic yeah. effect we want to have, not the I'll take less leaning yes. back in my chair. Correct. Yeah. No, very, very powerful. Uh, back to you, Christina. On, with respect to, and, and actually, this is a question for both of you that is worth addressing institutional capital talked a bit about DFIs, obviously. You mentioned pensions, local pensions stepping up. And that's really fascinating to someone like me, where that sort of is the golden ticket. How do we move more pension money? How do we move more institutional capital? Can you provide some illustrations how GSG or perhaps the DFIs of the world are being catalytic and or other sources of catalytic capital that might be encouraging pension funds at the local level to truly invest in their own marketplaces as commercial investors? Well, I wish we had solved this exact problem already, but we're working on it, let's say. So um, we're doing it in a couple of ways, and let me give you maybe three very specific examples um, where underground work is happening. So um, the National Advisory Boards in Ghana, Nigeria, and Zambia are developing specific blended finance vehicles for impact in their countries. So Ghana is developing a fund of funds, um, and the objective of that fund, well, obviously, will be to invest in the SDGs in the market, so for gender, um, for um, uh, climate change issues, and SME finance. And the way that they're designing it is that they're really hoping to get a number of different kinds of investors, some of them being those very catalytic investors at, at the get-go, to be able to create um, uh, an opportunity for the pension funds to then invest in that fund, the local Ghanaian pension funds. Mm -hmm. One of the great, um, I think, opportunities, especially in Africa, is that most of the pension funds has have already the opportunity and the legal, um, how do you say, uh, mandate and authorization to invest at least 10% of their assets into alternatives. Mm -hmm. So they could be investing in these kinds of products already, which is not necessarily the case in other parts of the world, where sometimes um, they have to have a legal, um, a mandate change in, um, in the legal system to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. So in Africa, they already can do that. The challenge is that they're not doing it because, um, and, and they're only investing less than 1% in alternatives on average in Africa at the moment. Um, they don't know how to do it. They don't understand these kinds of products. So there is a lot of education, awareness raising that has to happen. And that's exactly the role of the Ghanaian National Advisory Board, as well as designing this new structure and, 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 and really carefully crafting it and bringing in the different expertise sets and, and the investors, the, the, the blended finance investors that will make it 
uh, worthwhile for the pension funds to invest, they're also working with the pension funds, um, you know, having a number of meetings, breakfasts, to, to really show them the opportunity of investing in their own economy and the development of the impact in their own economy. Um, Taking the other example, maybe, of, of Zambia, they're developing with their central bank a credit guarantee facility. Um, and so the objective here is to uh, target specifically SMEs in the agricultural value chain. Uh, the agricultural sector is um, at least uh, creating, uh, you know, more or less 40% of GDP in, in, in Zambia. And, and so it's, it's an opportunity for them to finance the SMEs that don't have um, necessarily access to um, banking finance at the moment. Yeah. And they're also working there with the pension funds uh, to see how the pension funds can be one of the investors in this credit guarantee facility. Mm -hmm. So I think, and perhaps just maybe, I, Nigeria, they're doing something a bit different. They're doing a wholesaler funds, very similar to Big Society Capital, but in the Nigerian context. And a final example from Africa is South Africa, where uh, there has been a lot of work and co coordinated work uh, between the pension funds. So there's a whole kind of association of pension funds that have been looking at how they can invest in impact. And one of the fund managers there, Riskura, actually created specific um, investment uh, vehicles based on the needs of those pension funds because they have been really carefully understanding their needs and therefore creating something that is very specifically adapted mm. to that. Now, hmm. I, I can stop here, but I just say one word about, from my perspective, one of the biggest challenges we have today is how do we unlock the massive amounts mm -hmm. of capital held by pension funds in the global north yeah, um, to invest into the emerging markets. And that's the next biggest challenge to crack. Yeah, and of course, the current uh, global economic pending crisis may not help with that and then increase in global growth to 10% expectations, et cetera. So it's an absolutely spot on question that we're, we're continuing to focus on in terms of unlocking and is blended finance a solution to do so. Um, I, I want to just touch on the, the importance of an organization like yours because I think it's coming clear in this conversation too that we have to pair catalytic and capital together. We don't always pair catalytic partners or catalytic relations or catalytic um, ecosystem development with blended finance. And that's a clear part of this. It's not just the capital that's catalytic, it's the actions that are being undertaken here that are truly, truly catalytic. And and lastly, this is what you're describing in the, in the way of these pension funds at the local level, it's, there's a tremendous opportunity for leapfrogging. And you may already see this. We're seeing clearly that through this conversation the desire to be involved. Now, perhaps there'll be an expectation of, of financial leapfrogging in terms of investment. Um, so, Yasmin, back to you. And, and I think both of you are working on such unique, it's overlapping, but unique and uh, supportive areas. So, I would, you know, this is going to be much, much more of a technical area in terms of the MDBs and um, the DFIs. What is your perception, or, and I know maybe you can speak on behalf of BII on this, but should the World Bank sort of try to take more risk? Should they not remain at a AAA rated, as a AAA rated institution? It's impossible for you to answer on stage, absolutely, but just generally speaking, kind of what's the momentum in the market in terms of encouraging a World Bank to take more risk? I think your reference to credit rating is actually really important. We are not a rated entity. We don't borrow in the capital markets. So that's one of the reasons we're 100% equity funded. It's one of the reasons that we have the flexibility that we have. And I appreciate that other institutions need to work within the constraints that those things mm -hmm. bring. Um, having said that, I think one can be one. So I think the conversation earlier, you know, we used words like ecosystem and value chain. And so I think that point of identify who you are, where you sit in the system, and what flexibility you, you can avail of, right? Um, so for us, that is the fact that we're equity funded for other institutions. There will be places where they can be flexible. 
And actually, sometimes the thing that feels really obvious to you is really important to other people, but you overlook it because it's, it's in your own pocket almost. So there's, I think, there's value in taking stock of, of what your own constraints are and where you can push on the edges. I think that's point number one. The second point I would make is one can be catalytic within different types of instruments and different risk contexts. So let me give some examples, OK? So we make investments in, in all kinds of countries um, within the African and Asian context, from the more mature markets like South Africa and India to fragile countries like Sierra Leone. We had investments in Afghanistan and Myanmar as well. Um, still have, just not actively making. Um, and so there's one is country risk, mm -hmm. right? And you can think about the spectrum where you can play on country risk. Two, sector. And the sector can be um, a really interesting way to look at things. So let me make that, give you a, a live example to make that real. In the healthcare space, I would argue we are living in a golden age of medical care. All around the world, you know, the, the response to, to develop vaccines and deliver vaccines was incredible, except for a certain cohort of people, right? And, and one of the things that left a lot of countries at the back of the queue for vaccines was actually volume. They couldn't buy in bulk to get to the front of the line. And so there were amazing initiatives to, to aggregate that volume and, and pool procurement to bring uh, the poorer countries to the front of the line, um, facilitated by <laughs> catalytic organizations that use action mm -hmm. beyond capital. Uh, and we are really proud to have a company in our portfolio called Meta Access, which uses that concept of pool procurement, volume guarantees to help fix what I think is, is a fairly broken medical system that generates a lot of high cost products for high income countries. And the only way you can switch it is if you bring volume to, to, to kind of facilitate manufacturers to move to a lower cost product model. And so MedAccess offers volume guarantees to companies to try and catalyze their, their procurement. So their sector. So, you, you know, trying to solve challenges at the sector level. There's also companies. So you can have early stage companies. And if you're talking about early stage companies, well, you might be using a venture capital model, which means you're taking a whole lot of risk, but there might also be some return attached to that. So maybe that's something that your organization can get behind. And finally, instrument. So on instrument, you could be, uh, well, let me describe the, an actual example. Uh, so when COVID hit, it was really important for us as an institution to be counter-cyclical. We feel our job is to lean in in a crisis. We don't back away. So we also have a responsibility to our shareholder and, and our taxpayers whose money we're managing. We have a fiduciary responsibility there. So how do you take those two things and make a, a reasonable investment that can deliver impact? So we said, let's be catalytic in the way we use a really boring, tried and tested financial instrument, which is trade and supply chain finance. <laughs> Been around for decades. It is, I mean, they might have conferences for trade and supply chain finance, but I promise you it's not as glitzy as this. <laughs> and so we said, let's use tried and tested partners. We have existing relationships, so we're not taking risk on the banking counterparty. We're using a tried and tested instrument. But what we did was we said, we will guarantee the bank's risk on that Instead of 50-50, which is our usual product, we took up to 90% of the risk if they went into the riskiest countries. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, there actually, if you dig into it, there are a lot of places to play. And, and the, every institution has flexibility to find a place to be catalyzed. No, those are excellent slivers of examples. And with the trade finance background myself, I can relate. But, um, but, but yeah, feel free to add. Just just to react on that, uh, I, I love your last sentence. Every institution has the flexibility to act and, and be more catalytic and create better outcomes. I think, and the challenge is how do we incentivize those institutions to do that? Because there is the ability and then there is the reality on, on the ground. And, and I think that that's the real uh, conversation that is happening these days around 
how do we and beat MDBs like the World Bank, but also I think my, my assumption is that DFIs, that are bilateral DFIs like BII, like Proparco, uh, will be more, will be much quicker to, to shift because they only have, well, more or less, I mean, it depends, but more or less only one shareholder, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas MGBs have several. So now, just to come back to, to the question and, and the real discussion point is around mobilization of private capital. How do we incentivize and how do we increase the role and the ability of DFIs to mobilize significantly more private capital? On average, and okay, let's not go too deep into the data, but on average, they mobilize 0.4. So for every dollar invested, they mobilize 0.4 of uh, private capital, private commercial capital. It's absolutely not enough. Uh, we need probably 10x um, if we want to meet the 4.2 trillion annual uh, target of SDG finance. That's right. So, so that's the, the big challenge we have. To how do we go from 0 0.4 to 10x? And there is a number of things that need to happen. And please feel free. Besides to mandate change, yeah. which is how do we put into the mandate and into the KPIs, which it's not the case today. If they mobilize private capital, it's because of goodwill. It's because they want to do it, they have the opportunity to do it, but it's not because it's part of the objectives of the people working in the DFIs. Mm -hmm. It's not true for all of them, but just creating generalities for the sake of the conversation. And so therefore, um, that's one conversation that is happening at the G20. How, how do we change the mandate of DFIs to do that? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there is also a number of tools that you just mentioned that are already available, guarantees, insurance, uh, subordinated uh, investments, in, and, and a number of, of those tools are already there. Yeah. And it's how do we increase, dial up mm -hmm. the use of those tools that is, is part of the toolbox and has been in existence for a long time. So that's yes. the challenge. How do we change the the practices, the culture, mm -hmm. and the incentives inside organizations so that there is a much bigger flow of private capital towards those same um, SDGs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm loving this conversation, and I want to add on to this that I think it's really important that we are in incentivizing institutions to mobilize capital in the places where it's appropriate for that now and we allow for other places. I mean, our investments in Myanmar were on a great trajectory to mobilize capital into that country right behind us over time. Mm -hmm. If there hadn't been a coup, we would have, I think, delivered on that ambition. And, and there's something as well about, you know, the role of DFIs is also to be uh, mobilizing over time, be that first mover and demonstrate to others to follow. So we also have to, I think, count both kinds of mobilization because if we, we need 10x in every deal we do, we'll stop taking some risk. Yes. That's a fair point, and that's the, the leverage, leverage ratio point. So with that, we're at time, and I will only add on by saying that we talk a lot about advocacy with respect to uh, coordinated efforts on changing MDB's approach. I encourage MDBs to look at these very clear examples and templates of how they can change their approach with respect to financing at the local level. So thank you to you both, um, Christina and thank Yasmin. You. I will bid you farewell.